Carl, welcome to the show today. Thanks, Nick. Great to be here. Yeah, I'm really excited to have you. Would you mind giving our listeners the 411 on who you are and what has brought you to the show today? Great. I'm Carl Meyer, the founder of Abundan. We have developed the Abundan Tools app, which is great for helping companies that are moving from that sole entrepreneur with a small team to more of a team approach that you can scale up. That's that's really what we're about. And that's something I'm very passionate about. Love to help people grow their business and move up to that next level. Great. And can, how long have you had the business? Uh, the company's been in business for three and a half years. And we really... Uh, released the app earlier this year and are, have kind of transformed into a, a full-fledged software as a service company. And what did you do before you created Abundant? Well, over the years, I've done quite a variety of things, but broadly, you could group it into growing you know, startups and also lower middle market companies to the next level. Um, some of that was consulting, some of that was companies I started. So, but it's always been growing companies and helping them make it up to that next level. Have you always wanted to grow companies? Like, has that been something that since a young age that you just had that on the entrepreneurial bug inside you? Actually, it kind of is, which is not your average childhood story, I guess. But uh, uh, when I was 10, I, uh, my family ended up going on a trip to Disney World. And as I was asking my parents, you know, why are we going? How's this, you know, working? And, you know, why are all our cousins and aunts and uncles going with us and grandparents? And found out my grandfather had helped a gentleman many, many years before, and he'd become extremely successful. And I was asking my parents, you know, well, if we lent him the money, why don't we have the, the jet? that's flying us down there. And I, after a while, my parents told me to go play with my cousins were on vacation, but it really got me very interested in why one company grows and why another one doesn't. So that was, that's my journey. And, and along with that, was there, um, was there a lot of thoughts like that kind of, kind of put the fire in you. And then as your childhood developed, like, what, what was your first project that you got involved in? First, I started kind of learning a little bit about what all this business stuff was. By the time I was 12, I was reading the Wall Street Journal every day. And by the time I was 17, 16, 17, I was taking some economics courses. And it really wasn't until I got out of uh, college a few years that my parents kind of twisted my arm to leave the big corporation. I'd already gotten my MBA, worked for the big corporation for a while. They twisted my arm, come work for the family company, which was a distribution company. And that's when I really got exposed to smaller businesses and understood some of the dynamics that were going on there. And so that was about 30 years ago. So. And what kind of distribution company did, did the family have? Industrial products, pipes and valves and fittings, you know, kind of that old school steel, important stuff for making plants and factories. So, so was the, there was already a, a precedence, I guess, as far as a family business and the, the hardworking mindset and, and uh, that kind of that kind of mind frame uh, back then? Absolutely. So, it, you know, it started with my grandfather having um, you know, started some companies, restaurant and uh, some real estate uh, activities. And then my, my father started his company with you know, my mom helped uh, very much. And so they started the industrial valve distribution company. So there's definitely a history of, you know, starting things up and, and like you say, working hard. And then if you fa fast forward, um, the, the track after when you got started after the distribution company and actually going out on your own, can you, can you take us through like, um, you know, I'm assuming you were in your young twenties, like what it was like to finally go out on your own and start your first business. 
Yeah, I guess I was probably my my late twenties by the time I actually started my own company, and it, the first one was a uh, uh, dot com. It was a B two B marketplace for industrial products that I'd learned about with my parents, and that was that was like a whole new MBA in terms of learning about fundraising, tech startups. Um, and also learned a little bit about, you know, the, the life cycle of tech, new technology marketplaces and how they have collapses. So the, my second round of funding came a month or was supposed to come a month after the dot-com crashed. So that didn't happen. So that company got wiped out. And that was, that was quite a setback, both emotionally as well as financially. But then the next year, I was working with a partner and ended up helping him. Well, he started, it started as a consulting opportunity, and I was helping him with his consulting business. And we realized we could move some of the data collection and analysis onto the web that he had been doing manually. And so that ended up being my next venture. So. And on the very first venture, um, you know, a lot of different things going on there, the, the dot com bubble and and just uh, the, the way that the Internet worked back then. When, when the failure set in, um, were you sure that you didn't want to just go back to the family business or just back to the corporate world? Like, what was it that made you want to keep going? Well, I guess it's a little bit of, you know, I've seen what it is like you know the upside not so much necessarily it's great financially potential but it was also the independence not having that corporate boss not being in the situation where i i said we sh i think we should be doing it this way and just getting overruled without really necessarily a um, what i would consider a logical discussion and so that really kind of pushed my buttons and pushed me towards, you know, being on my own more. So that was, that for me was the really big thing, a little bit of controlling your own destiny. And with that controlling your own destiny, was there a mindset that set in that, that no matter what, you're not going to fail and you can be successful? Like, did, did you install that in yourself? Was that already there? Well, you know, the hard work is something that I don't know, I was a teenager and one of my, my buddy's mom actually commented that, you know, at 16 or 17, you know, you've got a middle age work ethic. So I guess that was always, always there somehow. But um, I did try and, you know, push as hard as I could to, to always be successful. One of the lessons I learned from the second business was, well, if you've got a partner, you either convince that partner of the path or you've got some, some real challenges. We, and the second venture, you know, we grew up to a certain point, but we had some real issues about pricing that we never came to terms with. And eventually, you know, the, you know, he was like, we're going to go left. And I'm like, we're going to go right. And it was tearing us apart. So we eventually brought in some investors and, you know, I just got bought out and moved on. So that was another lesson learned. And have you taken any partners after that? Really haven't. I really have. <laughs> you know, so, so it was a lesson learned then. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, if I was ever to take a partner on again, you know, there'd be a lot more discussions than I had the last time. That's for sure. Yeah, I think one of the things that I learned with with having a partner early on and then having the fallout is that you need to have the exit strategy mapped out, even if it seems like it's going to be perfect or a perfect um, partnership, you really need to know, okay, when things don't go right, this is, um, it's all written, you know, line by line, of this is the way it's going to go when when the fallout happens. Excellent advice. Oh, I couldn't reiterate that more. That's excellent advice. So tell us about your, your first, your first um, home run. Like what was the first business that, that you started up that just took off and, 
and your very first uh, success and what that felt like? Well, the the company that I <clears throat> I didn't start it, but I jumped into it and uh, helped it grow was a company we were doing services for major oil companies. It was preventative health type services. And we ended up taking a company that it was about a million revenue when I got involved and we grew it in four years, seven X. So it was over $7 million revenue in those four years and had a great tra trajectory. We'd built processes, we built the team. Um, but in this situation, you know, I, I was not a founder, so it really wasn't my baby as, as such, but it was a situation where I really trusted the, the CEO, um, and I was one of the C-suite executives. He then got so sick, he could never come back into work, and he's since passed away, and his one of his was closely held, it was not investor back. So one of his family members stepped in as the CEO and the company actually then went down faster than it had gone up. So it was both a wonderful success and then a, another lesson learned on how quickly things can turn and the importance of, you know, the value of leadership that, you know, leadership can really with the same customers, the same employees, same market, can just make the world a difference. So is that what you started to put together for your path was you started to see how to build teams out, how much leadership really meant. And, and then was it, was it the, at that point where you, you started to feel like you, you had something as far as you could help other businesses or was there another, um, another part of your journey that was, that was after that, that you came to that realization? That experience really was the transformational point. There was a lot of things that happened in terms of bringing together several lessons learned and going, wait, I'm starting to see patterns here. You know, I've obviously read a bunch of books, gone to lectures. I've, I've known some, you know, talked to some billionaires. I've talked to people, you know, multi, multi millionaires that have been very successful, but I've also talked to people who've gotten stuck and, you know, wouldn't change things in order to move to the next level. So that's what I call the abundant framework, which is kind of all the com compilation of the lessons learned. And eventually that has been the foundation that led to the abundant app. So these are the tools that I've used in various forms to help all these companies over the past 20 years to grow. And then now put them into tool form. So, you know, it's, you don't need that. You don't have to have an expensive consultant certainly benefit from one with these tools. And so that's kind of how I've brought, brought it all together. And have you, have you seen when you start, start to teach these things that, um, people are usually receptive to them, or is this something that you can, you have to really describe how important leadership is? I think, uh, for me, I've seen over to maybe the past 10 years that, that there's definitely a focus with social media on different leadership programs and leadership skills and seminars. And it seems like business owners are a little bit more, uh, apt to take those for themselves, but really, I think a lot of it is getting your team through a lot of this training as well. Absolutely. I, I think that's a real good observation. Certainly overall awareness in the last 20 years has increased dramatically for leadership. But not every, even if they're aware of the importance of leadership at a philosophical level, they may not identify it as the problem in their company. So many times what I've done is rather than say, come directly out and say, the problem is leadership, you know, I'll simply say, let's start using some of these tools. And usually I try and start with ones that are most easily accepted, like, you know, variations on org charts. Conceptually, it's not a real big step for most people. On the other hand, 
I was working not too long ago with a company. They they use the abundant tools, big fans at this point. But they were four owners and they, you know, were having some issues, got involved with them, got them to use the tools. But one of the tools that I was like, you really need to focus on this at this point was writing your mission and values. And two of the four owners were like, you know, that sounds like a lot of fluff. You know, I really very hesitant to do that. And it took like eight or 10 weeks, not full time, of course, but to build out those mission and values. And when we finally got done, they're like, oh, oh, now I get it. Now I see why these are so powerful. And they're, and so all of a sudden they're like, okay, now what do you have next? So. And when a company writes out those mission and values, I think a lot of times people feel like the work is, is done right then and there, but how important is it to actually communicate the mission and values to your team? Right. You are right on Nick. Writing them is, is a challenge and it's work, but it's really absolutely the, the beginning. If you don't use them every day in your decision-making, in your leadership approach, if you don't, you know, if you don't kind of walk the walk as well as talk the talk, they really don't, they don't prove anything. But if you do build them into this is how we run this organization, then it can, they can be a fantastic leadership tool. And how important do you find communication in the overall approach of the way a company does business? There's very few things that I'd compare in terms of importance for the success of a company. You know, just like, you know, a friendship, you know, you've got your buddies, you know, got to talk to them. If you don't talk to your buddies, you, you're not going to have a relationship. If you don't talk to your spouse, you know, if you haven't talked to your spouse in two weeks, you know, what kind of a relationship is there? And so with your employees, it's the same thing. You know, people are like, well, they know what to do. Well, there's a lot more to it than that. If you're not listening to them as well as telling them things on a regular basis, you just don't have that relationship. And thus the trust to tell, to get, you know, what's going on out there. You know, it's risky for an employee to come to their boss, certainly to the owner, and say, hey, I see something I'm, you know, out in the market or with a customer, something that worries me. You know, is this something we maybe need to look at? And that takes a lot of guts and trust, you know, from an employee. So, and that's all back to communication, just like you said. Yeah. And I think when that does happen, if the owner is receptive, they can really gain a, a lot of respect there too, because I think sometimes when the owners take the approach that they know everything, um, that's probably the worst approach they could take with, especially when you've got people out in the field that, that are, that are going through all the procedures and actually dealing with customers and clients and, and just the overall landscape of where business is right now, um, today in this environment. And then when they're doing that, I think as an owner, you've got to be all ears and, and listen to them. Right. And that's a really hard thing. I mean, we've, we all go through school, we're taught for the first, whatever, 20 some years of our life, that we're supposed to listen in order to answer, you know, get the right answer, respond. And really, in a relationship, it's really more about listening to understand. It's not about listening to respond. You know, it's good to acknowledge the feeling or the the comment, but it's not it's not necessarily important to solve a problem as much as it is to hear what's really going on, and that's that's really a whole different skill set that you know we aren't taught in school. Yeah, very true, and and I think when you're talking with employees, sometimes we run into employees that just have a a negative mindset or a negative energy about them. And how do you go, go ahead and try and turn that employee to, to think more positive, to not bring excuses every time that you talk to them? And, and when is the, the actual point where you just have to cut ties and realize that, you know, if your values are, are positive energy and you, maybe your values are 
um, just uh, just a good good vibes in general. I think a lot of companies uh, they get lost on maybe when they are writing their mission statement, and you know people love to throw in the word integrity, but really at the end of the day. You can have a lot of different values, but if you're not talking about having the, the right positive mindset and that every time that something comes up, it becomes a major issue, I think it can it can send you down a rabbit hole. So how do you deal with those issues? Absolutely. Very, very good point. To me, one of the first things you can do is examples, kind of, you know, mentors or just putting them around people and encouraging them to work with people who are very positive, who have the attitude you're looking for and, you know, encouraging the positive. It's really hard to say, don't be negative. That rarely have I found that to have any useful effect. So, you know, encouraging people to see examples, encourage them, you know, with rewarding any positive actions they do is, you know, that's the steps I would generally take. But you're right, at some point, you you only get so many times at bat before we say, time to move on, you know, you're, you're a great person. And, but you need to find the environment that's going to work for you. And this ain't it. So, um, you know, that can be done in a way that gives, a, you know, smoothly gives a person an opportunity to, to, you know, move on without, you know, burning a bridge necessarily. So there, but it's really important to get those people out of the organization if they, if they can't be changed. Is there anything in particular that comes up every time for the companies that, that is almost like, a red flag that needs addressed with the companies that you, when you see it, you have almost an uh, aha kind of moment because you're like, well, here's a great place to start. Do you, do you ever see that when you're teaching? I, I really do. And I think it's a point that you kind of mentioned earlier that having the, always having the answer, being the expert is a really red flag to me that people you know, they're listening at some level, but not, they're not really listening to understand. And that is just a huge red flag because that carries out through the whole rest of the organization in terms of attitudes and behaviors. On the other hand, if you can get that leader to transform into more listening to understand and not necessarily reacting with a, here's the answer or yeah yeah i know what you're talking about but really deeply understanding it transforms the behavior of everybody underneath that leader and so that is the most fundamental transformation i see and probably 95 percent of companies with you know under 50 or 100 million dollars of revenue fall into that. That is extremely common. And it's a tough transformation. Even when I've worked with people, not everybody makes it, you know, to that next level. But when they do, the results are phenomenal. Massive growth just happens. So you really, you really see and teach how to how to wire your mind different, how to think different and, and approach things different, right? Right. Right. And it's something, again, I feel like so many people are capable of, but just haven't been exposed to. And it's not necessarily something that I walk in and say, this is what you have to do. I try and use tools to lay the foundation and change behavior over time. And many times it works. So do you have a favorite success story on a company that you've worked with where, where this is um, actually, they've gone through the process, and it's made a tremendous difference in their company. Absolutely, absolutely. The company I mentioned earlier with four founders, when I was initially brought in, they were, you know, they'd known each other for many years. But when they started working together after a year or two, they really started arguing. The decision making process broke down. You know, they were. 
the, the level of trust was starting to, to break down, even though they'd known each other well for many years. And we were able to, you know, bring in tools like structured management to try and, and we were able to, over just a couple months, reduce the stress level, improve the decision making, it's really laid the foundation to start bringing in these other tools, the org charts, the one-page business plan, some of the other communication tools, one-on-one -on -one meetings. And over the course of about 18 months, two of the four founders in particular really changed their attitude. And it really had an impact on the company. They were able to go out and raise new capital to uh, do an acquisition and poised to, to grow you know, very quickly from there. So a lot of success through that. And what about the other two founder or the other two members? If two out of four uh, got it, what about the other two? The other two already, uh, there were people I'd known from a previous organization before they, they founded that one. So they, I'd already kind of been nudging them a little bit along the path. So they, uh, their transformation had happened a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. So now all four of them, are very much on that path. And what has it done to their overall business, their company, their sales growth? What has that done? Right. So, you know, yeah, they've been able to do an acquisition that they've been trying to do for a couple of years. They were able to raise money from investors, they got a good, you know, good valuation. And that has set them up. So now they're, and in fact, they, they even grew, they had a little, bump at the beginning of the pandemic, but we're able to grow through the pandemic while some of their competitors got really hurt pretty badly. So they, you know, they're just firing on all cylinders now. So it's really a, it, it's an exciting success story and it continues. And Carl, where can people get more of you if they want to get more of you? Absolutely. Well, they can certainly go to www.abundant.com abundant like a hamburger bun in a fox's den so if you have any question about spelling there and if you want to go check out our assessment of where your business is go to quiz.abundant.com and of course you can find myself and abundant on linkedin and the rest of the uh, social media platforms and would, would you go ahead and spell your your last name for everybody too just so if they want to find you they can find you Right. Unless you're from Germany, it's kind of a, a, maybe an unusual spelling. It's M-A-I-E-R and it's Carl with a K. Great. Now it's time to solve the equation of Carl's success. This is when I get to ask you seven rapid fire questions to solve the equation. Carl, are you ready? I am ready. Okay. Best seminar or teaching that you've ever been to? That was, uh, I got to hear Rod Canyon talk about growing compact computer. Favorite item you've bought recently under a hundred bucks? A fanny pack so I could go hike in Rocky Mountain National Park. Name an idol or hero of yours that you've met in person. It was Carl Lindner who became one of the 300 richest men in the United States and he was from my hometown of Cincinnati. Favorite book to give as a gift? That would be Tribal Leadership, Dave Logan. Something you do every morning? I walk the dog. Your personal mantra or favorite quote? Don't give up. Simple enough, right? Don't give up. <laughs> It. Place to go to decompress and reset. On a walk. Great. Carl, thanks so much for being part of the show today. We really appreciate it. And uh, to all our audience out there, I hope you enjoyed Carl as much as I did. Go ahead and, and get some more information about him. Check out Abundant. And to everybody, thanks so much for helping us today solve the equation.